It looks so good. It looks so good. So we are one, nine, six. Yeah, absolutely. So we're just uh, running the rover in our regolith room. Uh, this is actually the first time that we've had our engineering model rover inside of the pit um, with the MLI all packaged, electronics packaged. Um, so this is actually a pretty exciting time. Um, and it's working wonderfully. So uh, we're just doing a little bit of mobility testing, see how uh, the EM unit uh, compares to our other uh, development units. Uh, and really, we're just kind of playing around in the dirt, playing in the sand. Sometimes our main objective is to see how well our rover will drive when it gets to the moon. And so it's a long ways to go to do your test. So what we do here is we try to simulate what it would be like on the moon. So we have a lunar regolith simulant. Regolith is just the name for the, the surface dust that's on the moon. Uh, there's several different regoliths out there. Um, some of these are from NASA, some of these that we've developed in-house, some of these are from other uh, research organizations. And there is one, one aspect of lunar regolith that is not captured by GRC-1 uh, or by phyllite, and that is that um, actual lunar regolith has some compactibility to it, uh, meaning you can grab a handful of, you can make a snowball, like a weak snowball. Wet sand on Earth is compactable, right? But dry sand is not. You know, so we know from the lunar visits that there's some compaction to it, and it's a, there's a fancy term, dilation, that that the, uh, it's a combination of big and small particles and you see like when we go and hammer on the, th on the trough or we put a vibrator and we vibrate the trough, the small particles move in between the big particles and so the overall density, uh, the, the volume of the, of the material goes down because it's kind of becoming more compact. It has a dilating uh, characteristic and that's, that's uh, analogous to compactibility of, of things like wet sand or lunar regolith or even like flour. Um, so as Gary was telling you, uh, the particles are extremely fine. Um, when you touch some of these simulants, really it feels like flour, and that's the expected uh, consistency that you'll see on the moon. So rather than, uh, say, in a, in a typical sandbox where you'll kind of just sit on top, we expect to, with the small size of our rover, to sink down a little bit, so it won't necessarily hold the weight that typical sand would. On the moon, Gravity is much lower, it's about one-sixth what we have here on Earth. And so one of the things we can do here is if we know the rover is going to weigh, say a small weight, rover weighs six kilograms, uh, what we can, if we put that and test it on, the, on Earth here, it's going to be six times too heavy. So what we do in our testing is we'll go make a very lightweight version of a rover. So this is the rover minus the wheels, and this rover weighs about one kilogram. And so when we drive this rover here on Earth with full Earth gravity, it's pushing down onto the regolith uh, with the same force that it'll be pushing down on the regolith when we get to the moon. Uh, I tell people here in Pittsburgh, uh, we get icy weather and it gets hard to drive. And so when we need more traction, we do things like put cat litter in the trunk of our car, right? And it gives you more weight, more, you get more traction. Unfortunately, we, we know we're gonna be really light and we can't take cat litter to the moon, it's too expensive. So we have to develop special techniques in our controls, the, the way we control the motors, how we watch to see if the motor is turning as much as we want it to. If the rover starts to sink down into the ground, we might need to change our strategy. And we also change the design of those wheels to adapt to those, those conditions. And these tests are really useful for us. So like when we're going, doing slope ascents, uh, you can really kind of see, based on the different properties of the regolith, what kind of uh, shearing strength uh, the soil has. So like how much 
uh, grip do we actually get moving up the hill. Um, and that's, we've done a bunch of different tests, um, varying the, the widths of the wheel, varying the um, uh, diameters of the wheels, the number of grousers on the wheels to get more grip on there. Um, and this design that we've come up with has performed quite well with um, most of the tests we've done. Your kinematics of this robot, so it can't go to the side, and we're a skid steer robot. So when we're turning uh, the left side of the rover and the right side of the rover, those wheels are going to be uh, turning at the same rate. And so that will give you a spot turn, so you'll turn in place. Um, if you were to change the velocities of each side, you can actually create arc turns. And when you can kind of combine these core uh, methods of, of movement, you can get some really um, uh, complex maneuvers. So you can do figure eights if you wanted to, you can do some nice S turns. Um, so we have really wonderful mobility even though um, the drive system is relatively simple. Well, sending stuff to space can be quite expensive, so any attempt or any opportunity we have to reduce complexity, we're going to take. Um, and directional steering, that would be one. Um, I can't remember the name of the mechanism it is, but on a standard automobile here on Earth, you have the front wheels where you can uh, actuate them. Your mobility system, your structural uh, design, mechanical design is significant, significantly um, simplified when you can get rid of the extra moving parts. So you see a bunch of different rovers here in our test bed, uh, and they're each, they have a special job. Each one of them has a different job. Uh, the metal rovers, the ones with all the fancy MLI on there, that's uh, insulation to protect it. Uh, there's lots of dust seals, high-end motors and drives and things in there. That's our engineering model. That's the closest representation to what the final design will be. And we keep that for special tests. It's the kind of the final uh, proof of the pudding. But while we're developing, uh, work as we go along. Um, we can only have that one unit and it's very expensive and it's tied up in a lot of tests. So we have a lot of practice tests that we do, engineering development tests. And so for those, sometimes we're trying to learn about what the wheels should look like. How many, uh, uh, <laughs> I'll show you here, we have boxes and boxes of different wheels that we've tried, different shapes and designs and, and uh, we try to get traction uh, other times we're working on hill climbing, we're working with payload customers to help deploy their payloads. This is, uh, it's kind of a cross between being an astronaut and uh, being the pit crew in the Indianapolis 500. But every so often you got to stop and change one out and put the next one in. It's just a uh, part of the learning process. Engineering is a lot of design it and test it and break it and then fix it and go on from there. So that's what we're doing today. We're getting some practice uh, as the pit crew. Hi, I'm Kellen, one of the co-founders of Duro. We specialize in providing cloud-native PLM software for hardware engineering teams that need a better way to manage their product data from concept to end of life. Having previously worked as a propulsion design engineer at SpaceX, I know firsthand how challenging it can be to develop hardware for the harsh environments of space. Supporting engineering teams that are developing hardware for space is one of Duro's most exciting initiatives. We've developed the platform to be intuitive and easy to use, allowing engineering teams to focus on pushing the boundaries of engineering rather than on tedious administrative tasks. We're excited to be sponsoring Engineering Space and to be inspiring engineers all over the world.